Hi everyone. So our first topic while we are doing virtual learning um, right now is going to be education. And if we were coming to class this week, I was coming with a bunch of art supplies. And so actually what I would have been doing is giving um, a couple of groups a pencil and a piece of paper. A couple of groups would have gotten crayons and a piece of paper. A couple of groups would have gotten some felt and some scissors. And a couple of groups would have gotten some Play-Doh. And I'd ask you to make an apple out of those supplies. And then there's actually a brown paper bag to put your apple back in. And in addition to the art supplies to, you know, make an apple, I actually had family scenarios for your groups to read. And so when everybody's all done with that part, and this usually, this is one of the activities that everybody's doing. And they're like, we don't know why we're doing this. And so I bring you all back together. And then I try to pretend like I'm a kindergarten teacher. And it's atrocious because I'm the worst. So I'll be all like extra perky, right? like, good morning, boys and girls. And you all, usually when my students and I do this, everybody looks at me like I've lost my mind. Um, and I talk about, you know, we're learning the letter A and it's for Apple. And you had your first big kid homework because this is kindergarten now. And you're these, you know, super cool kindergartners with, you know, all the learning you're going to do. And then I ask like, because one student has volunteered from each group, one person has a different kind of apple. I ask students to share their apple while I'm role playing, like, oh my goodness, look at what a good job you did. And it shows kind of the inequalities being exemplified in the school system because those family scenarios that you've read together as a group, the whole class doesn't know your family scenario yet. You know that some families have an inordinate amount of resources and some families are really, really struggling. And so the student that just has the pencil and the paper, that's actually modeled after um, one of Sean's students uh, over the years who uh, lived in an apartment with several other families. And Sean got a chance to actually bring um, groceries and Christmas gifts home one year, many years ago to the student. And so it's a real scenario. The groups that have the crayons and the felt, I've made up those scenarios 100%. But the groups that have the Play-Doh, right, like really having uh, significant supplies in order to make an apple as kindergarten homework, is kind of based on um, an elementary school that Mac was placed at, um, our daughter, when because of her cerebral palsy, she was enrolled in a public school, but it was um, a preschool class for children with disabilities, and she was placed at a school with an inordinate amount of parental resources, and it really showed. And so the idea is to show the tension between what families have in relation to how that works out in schooling. And I won't go on and on about this, but never is it so true as right now what we're enduring. There's going to be some families that have resources to, you know, lots of learning capabilities, um, like learning opportunities for their students, um, you know, lots of different activities. Like I'm seeing families on social media this weekend talking about all the crafts they're going to do. They're going to have a spot, like all the ways that they're going to entertain their children as we go through this social distancing and quarantining and everything else. Then there's many, many families that are not going to have the resources to solidify their children's education in the coming weeks. And so, for instance, as I'm recording this right now upstairs, Sean's downstairs trying to put together lessons for the one math class that he teaches on his own. He's also a co-teacher with another teacher throughout the day. And his whole concern this entire weekend is, number one, students having access, but students even knowing because he's teaching students with moderate to severe disabilities how to even navigate these online portals and modules and learning systems and everything else. So the idea of family resources in relation to education and how crucial it is in education that families send students well-prepared, well-fed, like all of these different things. And that's been a tension that has existed for many, many, many moons at this point, right? It's something that very much has been prevalent and an issue because oftentimes schools and teachers even themselves, you know, by virtue of teachers earning a middle-class lifestyle, no matter how a teacher has grown up, it can be easy for them to not really realize what their students are enduring. 
And so that's one thing that we focus on in the beginning of class if we were together. But the other thing we focus on, and you took a look at the mission statements, and if you haven't, stop me right now and go look at that PDF, grab a scrap piece of paper, like I said, and just try to match up mission statements to those various um, statistics that I've given you. So read over it quickly, the, the various statistics I've given you, and then to the best of your ability. And those are real mission statements. And actually, this is an activity I've been doing for years, but I updated a cup every couple of years. And I just maybe 10 days ago updated it. And so those are the real mission statements right now. But if you haven't done it yet, stop, go look at that PDF, write down your guesses, and then come back to me because I'm going to go through them. But let's talk about mission statements altogether for a quick second. Like, I don't want to be skeptical, but how useful are they? I don't know, right? And my proof of that is Cal State University Long Beach, right? Tell me you know the mission statement right now. Tell me you've ever seen the mission statement, right? And so, you know, these statements are carefully crafted. They are all about, you know, what we want to achieve as a school, who we want to see ourselves as a school, what we, who and what we want to serve as a school, yet they're kind of buried on a website. So here, let me just take a quick second and show you Cal State Long Beach's mission statement. So you can see that there's a lot of great words in here. And on that worksheet, if we had been together, I was going to ask you to kind of go through those mission statements and see what kind of words or phrases that you really think should be in a mission statement. But I, I love so many of the words in here. Um, diverse, student-centered, um, hopefully, hopefully superior teaching, creative activity. You know that that is a super passion of mine. Um, I think it ends a little dramatically, like for the people of California and the world. But, you know, I, I can see a lot of value in this. But again, none of us ever see it. So something to kind of think about as far as how institutions themselves work. And you have to think in an institutional sense, like family is an institution, education is an institution, and they're institutions that are relying heavily, heavily on each other. So I'm going to just quickly review um, API scores. That's all the standardized tests that you took growing up. Um, they would be made into an API score, and that was like the perceived value of your school. Like a school was judged by its API score. And remember that a perfect score, as I mentioned with the little mission statement thing in the module, is a thousand. So something to keep in mind. But that's changed now, and I'll address that again in a second. Uh, English language learners are when a student's family indicates that English is not the first language spoken in the home. So that's how that designation is created. And then socio socioeconomically disadvantaged is actually a term that I have not seen used um, prior to checking through and updating everything a couple of weeks ago. Previously, it was usually indicated by showing what percentage of students qualify for free or reduced price meals. And so I'm glad to see that they're articulating this in a more hopefully nuanced way, indicating um, the impact that socioeconomics can have on a student's ability to navigate the institution, right? And again, think about structure and agency, free will, um, the burden of inequality, so on and so forth. Uh, API scores, because we've now changed from No Child Left Behind, which is the um, federal mandated learning that you grew up with, that, you know, the test is the test and that's what's important. Um, then we went to Common Core. And so now we have the CASP test, which is still actually being developed in a lot of ways. And so I also give you CASP uh, scores to kind of look at because they're much, much more current than API scores are extinct at this point. But I think it's an easier way to kind of see um, what schools had going. And especially because of those years, that API score was so, so, so important. Okay, so you've got your guesses, and I'm going to go through and talk to you real quickly about what the various schools were and kind of some of the various things that were indicated by the mission statements. Um, the first school is actually, I believe, Santa Ana High School. And so did you catch that it had um, spelling errors? So take a look at it because I know it's short. I, I shot, That's directly copied from the website. And so um, I was really, really surprised to see that, although please know, <laughs> I'm sure you're probably thinking to yourself, yeah, well, Professor Griffin, you have like 500 spelling errors in all of your announcements. And if I do, I am so sorry. Please know that I tried not to. But we're all fallible, aren't we? I hope. Maybe you're not. I certainly am. Um, Santa Ana High School, this has changed since the last time I checked. Previously, this used to state, like the last sentence of it was um, 
that they wanted students to be contributing members of society. And so you can see the API scores, you can see the percentage of students that are being identified as English learners and socioeconomically disadvantaged and the changes um, over the years. Socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, as you can see, that 93% is the current, well, current right now is 2019 because they have not, we're in the middle of the 2020 school year. And then uh, you can see the CAFs not met aspects too. Two is C, and this is Cypress High School, which is actually a high school in Sean's school district, which would be in a socioeconomic area of more middle-class families. And so what I think is interesting about this is you can see what the mission statement that you took a look at. I'm going to show you real fast. That's the mission statement they used to have. So it's like a three-page paper. I mean, my goodness gracious. But hopefully you could start to see the inequalities inherent even in an obscure mission statement where one school is talking about, you know, enthusiastic learning, absolutely important, but another school is talking about critical thinking and career preparation and all kinds of different things. And so something to kind of keep in mind. Three is actually um, the junior high that Sean works at. And this is a really interesting phenomenon too. Mission statements in some schools, it's the most open-ended, like vague, like says almost, there's barely a statement. Um, and so to go from where you've really tried to carefully craft what your mission is as a school to like a simple sentence, and granted simplicity can be powerful, absolutely, but it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. And again, and at any point you can pause me and just kind of look over on um, the mission statement in relation to school scores and things like that. Four is A. Troy High School is a high school in, I believe, the Fullerton District. These are all schools in Orange County um, that I've been using. And that is the type of school that is so high performing that families from outside the school district try to have their children, um, their teenagers, um, get into and go to, even though it's a public school, Troy High School. And so you can see where the changes are. You can see the language and the inequalities. And I'm going to just keep going. Five, Oxford Academy is interesting. Oxford Academy is actually another school in Sean's school district. It is a junior high and high school, and it's a junior high and high school public school that students are invited to go to. And so Oxford Academy, remember what I said a perfect API score is? A thousand. Look at that 2012 API score. I mean, that's like a couple of students missing a couple of math problems. So it's it's highest in the nation, like one of, if not the in some cases. And so something to think about. This isn't awesome opportunity for those students to get to the go to the school that is so, so high performing. But what does that do to all the other schools in the school district when you've taken the top, you know, one, two, maybe three percent of students and, you know, certainly given them an amazing opportunity to have a school culture of like off the charts achievement. But that's been removed from all the other schools for years now, for years. And so I, I, I'm conflicted because I want every student to have, um, you know, an amazing chance. But I also want every school culture to have, you know, seen the possibilities of, you know, the entire world. And so I, I struggle with that in some ways. And then finally, the last one, as you can see, that is actually a um, middle school, so I believe 6th, 7th, and 8th in Santa Ana Unified, and you can go through and see the various aspects of how, you know, certain schools do not have as many community resources as other schools. Oftentimes, when we talk about parents in relation to school, we villainize parents and we act as if they don't care, and that's not the case at all every, I mean, almost, you know, families care about their kids and want the best for their kids. But when we have such inequalities, like we studied a little bit with the game of life and talked about structure and agency, and then you've got families interacting with this institution that is so crucial to all of us, so much so that, you know, we're right now making sure that we're fulfilling, you know, the goals that you all have as students to, you know, finish this class and finish your other classes in unforeseen circumstances that we would have never imagined even a month ago. School's incredibly important. And so that tension, again, between family resources and school is something that I wish we could have had more time to dig into, but I promised you I would keep this under 15 minutes and I am running out of time. So thanks for taking the time to look at the mission statement. Please watch Miss Rita Pearson. She, man, if everybody knew uh, the things she said, I really believe it would change the world. And I can't wait to see your responses in the discussion board.